Welcome to the Shockwave Optima Calcium Masterclass, Class 2, an introduction to coronary IVL. Today we feature an interactive live case from Javier Escaned and Nieves Gonzalo from the San Carlos Hospital in Madrid. We will be hearing from Dr. Benjamin Forey, who will be talking about intravascular lithotripsy techniques. And to start the session today, I will be giving a talk on the fundamentals of intravascular lithotripsy. The basic setup for coronary IVL is balloon delivered technology. There is a single length coronary balloon with two emitters for the lithotripsy energy. The setup of this device is very easy. The purpose is to deliver the balloon catheter to the area of calcification. The shockwave C2 IVL catheter has a distal and a proximal marker, and in between those two markers are the two uh, lithotripsy emitters. The balloon, using RX technology, is advanced into the area of calcification, and as it's advanced into the lesion and the balloon inflated, once the balloon is inflated, the lithotripsy energy can be activated at a push of a button. The energy is delivered to the intimal and to the medial calcium and the calcium modification has taken place. The setup is extremely easy. The box that sits in, on, in the cath lab on a, on a movable trolley in the cath lab, positioned by the table, you confirm that the battery is charged, detach the charger, slide the door across and insert the connector cable. With the catheter, simply remove it from the packaging, prepare the balloon, so a one-to-one -one saline contrast mixture, and then connect the catheter to the connector cable. Once the balloon is in position, inflate it to four atmospheres, activate the energy, and then deliver the shock waves with a press of the button on the connector cable. Once the energy has been delivered, expand the balloon further to six atmospheres, then deflate the, the balloon following the first cycle, and then repeat. And here we see the setup within the cath lab. And this is uh, Claudia Cosgrave, James Spratt's uh, interventional fellow, demonstrating how simple the setup of this device is. So what you can see Claudia doing here is opening up the sterile sleeve and then the connector is then inserted into the sterile sleeve and then that is uh, to maintain the sterility on the catheter lab table. Now just for the purposes of this demonstration she's exposing the tip of uh, the connector cable but we would try and do this procedure inside the uh, sterile sleeve. But the process then with the catheter is then to, with the catheter that's been prepared, is then do, do the preparation with the contrast and saline in a one-to-one -one mixture. Sometimes people use a 60-40 mixture. So the balloon preparation is the same as you would uh, either a stent or a balloon uh, with, uh, with other RX devices. The indeflator is connected. Take the balloon out of the uh, protective sheath and then here you see the connection using this magnetic connection and there we are, that is now prepped and ready to go. So once it's been delivered to the calcified area, then you can deliver the energy. Now, IVL is most effective in lesions with a calcium arc of more than 180 degrees. And so when the energy is delivered to a lesion where there is less than 180 degrees of calcium, there is dissipation of energy in the non-calcified side of the vessel. With a concentric lesion, there is wave reflection. And this wave reflection means that the signal is amplified within this area of concentricity. So the energy delivered is higher earlier on in the balloon activation. 
So what we see with this concept of wave amplification is that there is the fundamental frequencies and the harmonic frequencies and you get this composite of all these various harmonic frequencies and within a concentric lesion there is significant there is significant uh, enhancement of the energy delivery within concentric calcification. So what we see here with concentric calcification, the balloon is inflated and you see in comparison in the left uh, vessel here that there is eccentric calcification. So with the first activation of the energy, when you first press the button, within the concentric lesion there is very significant wave reflection and in fact it, it, it is normally the case that with concentric lesions that you achieve the maximal effect with the first few pushes of the button. With eccentric lesions energy is still delivered to the area of calcification but because of energy dissipation in the non-calcified vessel then you need to deliver more shockwave energy. But remember, each balloon has 80 shocks to deliver in total. And knowing which lesions to treat is really help, it's extremely helpful to have intravascular imaging. It's not essential, but if you want to identify the areas where the IVL is going to be most effective, identifying the concentric lesions as well as the eccentric calcified lesions, then intravascular imaging is extremely useful. With intravascular ultrasound, in particular, you can delineate the calcified arc. And with OCT, you get a higher spatial resolution. And not only can you identify the arc of calcium, but also the thickness. And here we see this is a fly through a coronary artery with an area of calcification. So you'll see in the panel uh, on the right, the axial views, and as we're coming down the tunnel on the left, you can see the areas of protrusive calcium, and we're just flying through them now, and you can also see within the longitudinal view the areas of calcification. But really they're best seen in the axial view on the OCT. You can see the areas of calcium arc and thickness. And following modification, so this is that same vessel, and you can see that the vessel is already expanded at the areas where there was uh, calcification. And what we will do is we will fly through the lesion and going up and down on the longitudinal view and looking in more detail on the axial view, you can see the effects of intravascular lithotripsy with cracking of the calcium. So visible fractures that you see here visible fractures uh, are there on OCT. So intravascular imaging shows the mechanism of action. It also shows you where you should be targeting your uh, shockwave energy. And whether it's with OCT or intravascular ultrasound, you can see evidence of calcium fractures. And what we see here is with that same lesion is that the lesion is fully expanded and the vessel is now uh, now completely treated with a fully expanded and opposed stent within the area of calcification which has now been completely dealt with with the shockwave energy. Intravascular imaging of calcium pre and post shock wave is extremely useful to demonstrate the mechanism of action. And it is clear that you can see this with both OCT and with IVUS. So in both these panels here, you see calcium fractures. And what we see in this, uh, the same vessel that we've seen before is that following shock wave IVL, with stent implantation, and we're now flying through that area of dense calcification where there was both eccentric and concentric calcification, is that the calcium has been modified and has allowed full stent expansion. So IVL, shockwave, has allowed full stent expansion 
after the low pressure inflation and the delivery of the shockwave energy. And this is shown beautifully using OCT to show the stent expansion and apposition. IVL is very uh, effective in large vessels where there is a high burden of calcium. And so whether there is intimal calcium or deep wall calcium, the IVL energy will penetrate from the intimal layer right through the medial layer. So in very large and severely diseased vessels, IVL is highly effective. And therefore, the energy delivery should be along the whole length of the lesion where there is dense calcification, not just at the areas of focal concentric calcification, but all along the entire length of the calcified lesion. So you may need to prepare the vessel uh, with a crossing device such as rotational atherectomy, but remember that atherectomy will modify only the intimal layer of calcium it will not touch the medial calcium. The only technology currently that can do that is uh, IVL. Now here you see a concentric calcified tube in a proximal LAD with the balloon won't advance right through the lesion. So this is the shockwave balloon in the left panel. And what we're doing here is we've got the nose of the balloon into the proximal part of the lesion. And so that is then uh, inflated. The balloon will then advance through. And in the right lower panel, you see the expansion of the balloon. The concentric part of calcium is in the distal part of the lesion here. And you see full expansion. And in this case, we see the effects of the intravascular lithotripsy in a longitudinal view. And here you can see this uh, 3D rendered view of the coronary artery where there you can see the longitudinal fractures. So in this 3D rendered view on the left, you can see the longitudinal calcium fractures and really very nice demonstration in the axial views of calcium fracture from the intimal layer right through to the deep medial layer of calcium. IVL is extremely effective in large vessels with a heavy burden of calcification. It is more effective than rotablation in large diseased vessels with a large lumen where there is a heavy burden of both intimal and medial calcification. So in conclusion, the fundamentals of intravascular lithotripsy. Well, firstly, it is easy and quick to set up. The coronary balloon has two lithotripsy emitters. The balloon is inflated to four atmospheres for shockwave delivery. Intravascular imaging is helpful. Firstly, it indicates the balloon size that you need to use, and it shows the mechanism of action. IVL is most effective in concentric calcification. Wave amplification can occur in concentric lesions, but it's also effective in eccentric calcification. And the goal of delivering shockwave energy is to maximize stent expansion. Thank you for your attention. It now gives me great pleasure to move on to the live case uh, for class two. And we have Javier Esquened and Nieves Gonzalez in Clinic San Carlos in Madrid. Mm. And we also are joined by my friend and colleague from New York, who has got up especially early this morning, Azim Latib uh, from, from Montefiore in New York. And Benjamin Foray will also be joining us for, uh, for live case commentary. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over now to Javier and the team in Madrid. And we've got a great case to present for you today. Thank you, Jonathan. It's uh, first of all, the welcome to Hospital Clinico San Carlos. It's a pleasure that you join us today um, to this case we are going to share with you. We are very thankful to the patient who has kindly agreed that uh, his intervention is going to be shared with you. And also it's always a pleasure to be with Nieves Gonzalo uh, uh, with me. I'm going to hand it now to our fellow from Ireland, uh, Brida Hennessy who is going to introduce the case and shortly will be showing you what we've done so far. So, Brida, over to you. 
Good morning. Um, first of all, I will just present uh, the, the team here. Uh, we're joined by Javier Scanet, Nieves Gonzalo, and our nursing team today are Maria Jose Morales and Angel Ramos. So this is a case of a 67-year-old gentleman who presented with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. His cardiac risk factors are significant for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia. In terms of his past medical history, he has a, he has a history of obstru obstructive sleep apnea and autoimmune pancreatitis. He, in terms of his cardiovascular history, he presented in 2017 with unstable angina. He underwent surgical revascularization with a lima to his LAD, with a rema in T to his OM. At that time, he had preserved LV uh, function with moderate MR. Uh, this current presentation was precipitated by a week of intermittent typical chest pain, predominantly on exertion, with two episodes at rest. His ECG demonstrated sinus rhythm with ST depression in his inferolateral leads. His repeat echocardiogram showed normal LV size and systolic function with paradoxical septal motion and hypokinesia in the posterior lateral wall with moderate mitral regurgitation. In terms of his laboratory uh, investigations, he has a normal hemoglobin, platelet count, and creatinine. And he had a mild elevation of uh, his troponin I, which was an ultra-sensitive uh, assay. So here we can see his uh, diagnostic angiogram from last week. We can see that there is a severe calcified stenosis in his distal left main, Medina 111. Uh, there's a severe calcified stenosis of the ostium of the dominant circumflex. The LAD is occluded from the ostium. And the right coronary artery is small and uh, non-dominant with no stenosis. Uh, we then assessed his graphs. He had, had a patent lima to his LAD uh, that, fills the LA, uh, that fills the LAD retrogradely, and we can see a moderate stenosis before the anastomosis, and the rema in T was occluded. So in summary, this is a case of a 67-year-old gentleman with multiple cardiac risk factors. He presented with a non-STEMI. He's had prior uh, surgical revascularization with bilateral mammary grafts to his LAD and OM. He has a, a distal severe calcific left main stenosis, Medina 111, with a patent lima to his LED and an occluded rema graft in T to his OM. And I will hand you back over to Professor Scaned to discuss the procedural planning. Thank you, Brida. So, yes, in summary, what we uh, consider is that, um, you know, in this patient who has a protected uh, left main stenosis, heavily calcific, you will see in a second more detailed images. Um, we should first uh, obviously guide our procedure using imaging. It's important to see the effect of plaque preparation before stenting, making sure that we get um, where we want um, before implanting the stent, and of course, optimizing stenting. Uh, we, for this particular case, we thought in, in lithotripsy as the best choice in terms of plaque preparation technique. Why? Because there is certainly no device that can achieve plaque preparation in such a large vessel and with such high degree of, uh, of plaque. We will be concerned, you know, that um, using just, a, 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 even if we will use a 175 or, or a two millimeter bore for a rotational atherectomy, we will not actually make adequate changes in, the, in this huge nodule of calcium that we see there. We, we have obviously calcium in both, um, uh, uh, at both sides of the artery, but there's a huge uh, calcific uh, nodule that you will see in a second. And we want to really uh, act in depth into this nodule, nodule calcium uh, in, to make it as plastic as possible so we have less risks when expanding the stent that there is, you know, um, any potential complication. Um, so what we've done so far, let me just show you some of the, of the pictures we have obtained so far. So um, here you can see more in detail this uh, huge uh, calcification that you have in the ostium of the circumflex. You see that there is a small uh, branch uh, there. Uh, a small obtuse branch or intermediate branch, if you wish. This is another of the views. Uh, well, it was, it was a bit tricky to go with the guide wire 
but eventually we, we managed uh, with the help of a microcatheter uh, to go with a Sion wire and then we exchange for a Sion Blue extra support or extra backup in order to make sure that we have uh, good support. And of course, in order to perform imaging and we opted to use OCT in this particular case, we had to make some way through it because as I said, it was impossible to advance, it was with difficulty that we managed to go with a microcatheter. So we used a 2.0 uh, balloon um, again, this is something that we do in many occasions. You can see that, of course, it was difficult to open a way in this uh, area, but we managed to, to do that and to place uh, an OCT imaging catheter so, uh, and Javier, I'm going to handle it to Javier, yeah? before, before you show us the, these uh, images from the OCT, I'd just like to uh, open the discussion and bring in Azim Latib. Um, so really one of the world's most experienced complex PCI operators now moved from Milan to New York. Azim, before the advent of intravascular lithotripsy, this, this would be a, a fairly typical type of lesion for you to, to be treating. Uh, what would be your approach before lithotripsy was available? How, how would you approach this? Yeah, that's a great question and a great case again from Javier and the team. Um, I guess before lithotripsy, but even right now in the United States, um, we've just gotten lithotripsy approved by the FDA this year. So we've just started using it uh, in the last few months outside the context of a clinical study. And it's only in limited centers still available. So I think it's still for the US, this is still current practice in the sense, what would you do without lithotripsy? And I think in most centers, they'd, they'd be going with atherectomy, probably going with a 1.5 or 175 burr, and then followed by cutting balloons. Um, we do also have CSI here in the United States. I know it's just become available in Europe too. Um, you could CSI this lesion as well. Uh, it's a little bit on a curve, but I think if I was going to use atherectomy, I'd probably be using rotational atherectomy. Um, if I look at my practice right now, you know, I would say this might be a case where I would do, you know, atherectomy followed by shockwave. And it's a severely calcified lesion. And I don't think it's it's beyond the realm to say that sometimes, you know, we use the atherectomy to cross the lesion and create some space, some space. And then we use the lithotripsy because it's such a large vessel to really impact the calcium. So Javier, you've been one of the pioneers of shockwave in Europe and I think probably did the first live left main case I think at Euro PCR a few years ago a very impactful case that it was so you've had quite a, a, a body of experience now treating this type of lesion just describe to us the particular advantages of shockwave in this type of lesion with this size of vessel in comparison to the uh, pre-shockwave calcium modification techniques? Absolutely. So let me, let me first um, uh, clarify that for the time being, uh, treatment of uh, unprotected left main stenosis with shockwave is an off-label indication that, you know, we have to gauge in a specific patients. And, and as, you as you mentioned, in Europe, we have gathered already uh, some evidence that is supporting that it's very safe. Uh, this is a case of an unprotected uh, left protected. main huge calcification, as typically happens in many patients who have previous cabbage. And um, the, the, the lessons that we have learned is that in the left main environment, you have distinct advantages of um, um, lithotripsy over other atherectomy techniques, uh, particularly related to the size of the vessel, uh, the fact that you can uh, use a device that is, you know, four millimeters in diameter, to prepare your plaque. Second, the, the fact that you transform the mechanical properties of that uh, huge amount of calcium that typically you find in these patients in something that is more plastic and therefore more deformable when you implant the stent and you, you ensure a better expansion. And third, also something very important, it's a technique that allows you to keep uh, wires in the circumflex and in the LAD. Uh, which, you know, in, in, in many occasions is something that is desirable uh, because even if it is rare to have occlusion of a side branch while you are, when you are performing rotational atherectomy, for example, 
uh, even then, you know, it's reassuring in many occasions that you have been able to wire successfully a difficult circumflex. You want to really have a wire in place and not to have to, to wire the circumflex later after you have performed rotational thyrectomy to the LAD. So these are some of the specific advantages that we see in, in, um, in the left main scenario. So just going to ask ben Benjamin, just to describe what you would be looking for with intravascular imaging. We're about to see some uh, OCT uh, pictures. Uh, I think they've already been acquired. What, what, what are you going to be looking for in particular? And what are the features that would make this a, a, a lesion particularly suitable for, for shockwave treatment? Yeah, good question. This by the fact that uh, this is a large vest angiogram is obvious. In IVUS or RCT, we're uh, going to look for uh, the angle of the calcium. If it's more than uh, 180 degrees, it's going to be uh, more efficient with shock wave. If the calcium is uh, de deep, uh, deeper, uh, it's going to be more efficient also, and it's uh, very often the case in post-cabbage patients, and uh, at uh, least uh, the, the thickness of the calcium, and we can appreciate it very well in OCT and also in with IVUS. So these three factors are key uh, to select uh, uh, the, as much as possible the good patient. Wonderful. So, Javier, I, I know you've got these, these pictures ready to show us. Is it possible for you to take us through uh, your sure. intravascular imaging here? Perhaps, Absolutely. Perhaps so we can show so full, full screen OCT here. So Nieves is going to uh, review the case uh, with all of us, and she's going to emphasize some of the key aspects on how this information will help us in, in, in subsequent steps. Okay, thank you, Nieves. Yeah, so um, as, as Benjamin uh, uh, suggested, there are three things uh, that we need to look for in this when, you're, when we are evaluating uh, calcium. Uh, one of them is the thickness uh, of the calcium, the arc extension of the calcium, and also the longitudinal extension. And as you can see, uh, I'm showing you here this area of um, the stenosis. We will go a little bit later to the references, but just to show you here the stenosis, you can see that here we start with the area of stenosis. You can see already a lot of calcium that uh, appears here in OCT as this low reflectivity area. And actually, the calcium is so thick in this patient that um, with OCT, we are not even able to see the complete uh, thickness of the calcium, given the limitation in penetration that we have with OCT. But for sure, this is more than 0.5 uh, millimeters, so it's very thick uh, calcium. You can also see that at this level, for example, it covers more than 180. If we continue uh, along the lesion, here you will see that again, the lumen gets smaller and the calcification gets even more circular. And actually, uh, at this point, you can see that the calcium is quite, uh, is quite uh, deep, but it's also very thick. As I mentioned, actually, uh, there are areas where we are not able to see the complete um, thickness of the calcium, given the, the, uh, the thickness of this, of this calcification. We are reaching here another area where you will see that we have a more oval shape of the lumen. And again, you can see calcium that is here imprinted on the lumen. You can see, again, some calcific areas here. And again, very thick calcium. You can see that it's extending clearly more than five millimeters. We are already um, uh, covered more than five millimeters with these uh, images that I'm showing you. More calcium at this level. Here is really one, 360, so it's almost circular. And here, if we go a bit more proximal in an area that you can see that the vessel, uh, the, I mean, we have uh, past the stenosis here, but you can see that here we have another type of calcium. We have a small calcified nodule that is really not um, producing a lot of uh, lumen decrease at this level. But you can see here that this is a different type of calcium. You can see that it uh, has these irregular shapes. It produces in the lumen, gives shadow in OCT. This is a calcified nodule nearly at this as, level. Nearly as picule. Mm. Eh? Mm? You, you say that it's nearly as picule over there, or do you think that this is the type of calcium that may puncture time to time the balloons? Well, it's, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a calcified nodule. Yeah, it's yeah. very, uh, no, it's protruding, very... No, so is pointy it, shape. Mm. Nieves, is it fair to say that there is, so there's significant concentricity here, but through this lesion, there are areas of eccentricity in terms of the thickness, 
there is some protrusive calcium. Um, so in fact, you've got all, all three uh, sort of main uh, subsets of calcium distribution here. You've got concentric, some eccentric, and some nodular protrusive. So could you yeah. just go to the segment of the uh, AV circumflex beyond this, this very tight stenosis? I think you've taken a measurement quite distally. And just if you can see, if we can do an external elastic laminar measurement there, if you've perhaps more, pro I think probably... Perhaps well, you know, we have some, uh, as you can see in the yes, OCD the images, clearance, there's, there's, there's some yeah. blood. Yeah, there's some blood and this is, I mean, it's a very large vessel and sure. we have a very tight stenosis. So this is challenging a scenario yeah. for OCT to achieve uh, good blood clearance distally. But still, I mean, we can, uh, we made a measurement a bit more distal where the vessel yeah. looks actually pretty much the same. And you can see here the measurement of the external so elastic yeah. membrane that is uh, around 4.5. So I think it will allow for sure using a 4.0 Sure. Uh, shockwave balloon, that is uh, our idea. And then we went, um, and we the left took main a measurement size, uh, what's the in, the in the left main here. Yeah, we have here the measurement of the of the left main that you can see, which is very big. I mean, here the, yeah. the sternal elastic membrane is more than more than five. I mean, but um, so probably in, the, in the left main, as there's not much black, we could land it, um, we could land it, in, I mean, according to the to lumen size, so the idea is that probably we could yeah. postulate this with a 5-fold balloon, for example, sure. in the left main. Sure. And we have a length, mm. uh, roughly, we have calculated that perhaps with 24 millimeters, yes. yeah. we'll be able to do the You can see the here job. the calculation yeah. of length, um, also taking and using this very, very helpful feature of uh, co-registration in angiography. You can see here this uh, white dot that is indicating that if we land our stand here, uh, we will be 24 millimeters to the to the reference that we have chosen in the left main. So Azim, could I ask you to comment to how, how what's your interpretation of these OCT findings? How, what what device would you select? Uh, what, in particular, what blue, balloon size, shockwave balloon size would you use? And what's your interpretation of the calcium distribution here? Yeah, uh, great question. And I'm going to bounce that back to both you and Javier in a second because I'm I'm here to learn from both of you too. Um, but I think you know based on what I'm seeing in the OCT, I think you have to go with a four balloon. Um, you want to get as close to the lumen size as possible. Um, so I would definitely use a four. I'm dying to see what shockwave is going to do here because. I think what makes this case so interesting is the fact that there are all three types of calcium that we would see, right? There's the more superficial concentric calcium, there's the deep, thick eccentric calcium, and there's a calcified nodule. So you couldn't ask for a better case yeah. to really highlight yeah. what shockwave can do. But the one thing I, I would ask to you and Javier maybe to share with me is there seems to, when I talk to people, a lot of confusion about whether you can use shockwave in eccentric calcium versus concentric calcium. Um, yeah, I just did a, a left main case last week where I showed it to my entire team and I said, I wanted to do shockwave and they were always, oh, no, no, it would never work because it was very nodular eccentric calcification of the left main. And the result was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely fantastic. So maybe if you could share some of your experience well, about that. Perhaps if I could comment on that. And I think in, in the presentation that I gave earlier, uh, and this is the concept that's been introduced by James Spratt, uh, looking at the this idea of wave amplification. So within concentric lesions, the reflection within a, an area of concentricity uh, really maximizes the effect with the first uh, phase of pulse delivery. So often within the first 10 shocks that are delivered within a concentric lesion that the modification will take place uh, at that point. Where there is a degree of eccentricity and there is dissipation of energy in the non-calcified side of the vessel, there is still some modification effect on the eccentric calcium but you have to deliver more shocks. So in this particular type of lesion, and I think uh, Javier may, may, may also support this view, is that we should deliver all of the shocks from, the, from one balloon, which would be 80 shocks to this region. So it would effectively be keeping the balloon roughly in that position uh, uh, over this area of what appears to be uh, the sort of apple core lesion, and all of the energy, so all of the 80 shocks we would deliver. And I think it's that uh, pulse management strategy 
where you've got both concentric and eccentric uh, uh, calcification within the same lesion is where the shock, the shock wave energy, all of it needs to be delivered for its maximum effect. And so I, I think uh, Javier, rather than just delivering 10 shocks here, so one pulse sequence will be, I, I, I hope, will be delivering all of the shocks. Javier, can you comment? You've done quite a lot of left main uh, cases now. What's, what's been your, your experience where there's been predominantly eccentric lesions? Is it effective? Or yeah, that's a, it's, it's a very good uh, point. And, um, you know, even as uh, Azim was mentioned before, in some cases, we have opted also to perhaps uh, to perform first a rotational atherectomy, you know, um, particularly in those cases where we anticipated a lot of problem in advancing later the device and subsequently um, uh, um, um, lithotripsy. And probably, you know, there is a synergy in, in some cases and perhaps it's nodular calcium. We, we are working on, on understanding, you know, if the pattern of calcification influences the outcomes. Actually, Nieves is, uh, is the PI, and I have the pleasure of being the co-PI of, uh, of a study uh, looking prospectively with OCT to the pattern of calcification and how this is uh, influenced by, by um, shockwaves. So we will have some information in, in the future. But I also fully agree with you um, Jonathan, in the sense that we have to be ready to deliver a lot of energy here. You have to be patient. You really have to be patient. You have to, you know, and sometimes move your uh, shockwave balloon, not perform always the hits of energy in a particular point. We've seen that sometimes it is more important to start changing the uh, characteristics of the shoulder of the calcific plaque, yes. being able to then subsequently modify this. And monitor, you know, also the progress that you are making, sometimes making a rotational angiography to see if your balloon is making progress mm -hmm. in expanding, you know, in concentric uh, lesions. So if you, if, 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 if it is okay with you, we yes, would like please, now to please show go you... ahead. So you've selected yeah. a four millimeter balloon. Uh, so yeah. that, that is the largest size balloon for the coronary circulation. Um, so Nibis is, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Gonna, that, that's his, perhaps we can see this, you doing the setup on the table. Is it possible sure. to angle your... Yeah, can we show them? Yes, we can see it very well. You can see that Nieves, perhaps you can plug it and unplug it again, uh, is uh, connecting now the power source. This is very simple because it has a magnet. Yeah. So it connects very nicely. Before that, what we did is we prepped the balloon properly. I mean, it's, it's very important that you debubble the balloon a lot. If you have air left into your balloon, that will dissipate the energy and your, 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 the delivery of energy will not be as effective. Even sometimes, and perhaps we'll do it in this case, sometimes because you generate the CO2 inside the balloon as a consequence of the shock waves, sometimes you have to debubble the balloon, you know, mm -hmm. over the procedure. Uh, but it's really important. So we did, uh, you know, several cycles of um, deflation, inflation, or well, deflation, okay. sorry just to make sure that there is no no uh, and no air inside the balloon. And you've prepared this... So now this... we go with the system. Sorry, Javier, you've prepared this lesion already. You've clearly, you've crossed it with an OCT catheter. So I, I think yeah. uh, probably in your experience that if the OCT yeah, will important. cross, then the shockwave balloon will cross. But to, to cross with the OCT catheter, you used a two millimeter balloon to, to prepare the track. Is that correct? Yes. That's yes. correct. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So uh, perhaps you want to zoom here. Uh, yes, we can. Adam, we can see your hands there. Yes. You can see the balloon. You can see basically the two emitters that that are inside. Yes, we now, can see. Now let me let me just refresh. You you know how this works, of course. But just the colleagues that never have seen how this works, let me just refresh this with a small video that we are going to show you, basically um, showing how uh, what happens when you deliver energy. And you can see these sparks that actually are generating, you know, compressive and decompressive forces. It's like, you know, a tearing uh, energy delivered to the calcific plaque. You can see that also there is generation of CO2 bubbles inside the balloon uh, as a consequence of the sparks. Uh, so remember this because later while we are doing the um, delivery of energy in the patient, you probably will see radiologically speaking also the bubbles appearing inside the balloon. Good. So I go back to uh, to now to the wire. We have um, in the meantime we also placed a, small, a wire in a small vessel 
that it is, uh, you can see, can we go, um, can you show the whole screen, Adam, please, with the uh, angiography, et cetera. Okay, so now you are seeing the, oops, uh, the yeah, wires moving a bit. Working back Sorry a little bit, yeah. Sorry, my wife has so moved you've got a, a wire bit, in the, uh, is there a, there's a marginal vessel there, is there? And then you've got flush, flush mm -hmm. occlusion yeah. of the yeah. LED yeah. here. No, sorry, I see. Now you... Yeah, just, uh, yeah. Let me just make sure that I advance my wire beforehand because it was, it moved a bit now. Just making sure that everything is good here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you, you see that they also position uh, a wire in this uh, small this branch? Small uh, margin, oh, yeah. um, We will see later what to do, but obviously, you know, it will be nice to keep it open. It's not that uh, big branch, but uh, it's certainly good. Yeah, it has some disease in the ostium, but um, yeah. Hmm. No, it's uh, in terms of in terms of um, for those colleagues that have not uh, used it. In terms of maneuvering, is obviously a. More bulky device than a, than a conventional balloon, but you know, as um, as Jonathan has said, one of the good things of performing before, you know, uh, in imaging and to negotiating also these uh, other devices is that it helps also in understanding if you will be able to roll through it. The angle is not too tight. I feel a bit of resistance. I can see because I have my my wire in that small obtuse marginal that still I have not crossed. You know, I try to. Advance it a bit more, not to not forcing too much okay. because I don't want to do so damage. Cross. Device. So not but too much. This is good. Not, not too much yeah. force required there. Yeah, it was quite all right. Yeah, and we're using a seven French guiding catheter from the right from right uh, radial artery. Now, um, Javier, if you wouldn't mind, uh, it, if you could centre up on the balloon and perhaps add a layer of magnification, and then when the sure. balloon is inflated and you're about to apply the energy, if you wouldn't mind doing that on acquisition, just so we can see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, 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 we will do it, yeah. We'll try to see, you know, this is probably a good uh, view where we can see it nicely. Okay. I will call it made. Um, yeah, so next thing that happens, I, and we are going to describe what it comes next, Nevis is going to inflate only to up to four atmospheres. And the reason is because you don't want to stretch the, the narrowing. You just want to make sure that the, the walls of the balloon are touching the, the plug, so you deliver the energy through the, uh, through the polymer of the balloon. Mm -hmm. She's going to stay like that, and I'm going to start my cycles uh, in this, uh, with this button. So uh, Nieves is inflating there. Just four atmospheres. I will go now in Cine so you can see okay. what so happens. You're in the distal, okay. distal part of the lesion. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy. And you can see the bubbles we spoke uh, yeah. before yeah. generating there. So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, we will for a second. Uh, you can see the, the EKG is good. So a second in uh, the same, no same position, yeah. And I think, I that, think, the, so, I yeah. think that we next one we will, be, will be also in the same position. You know, we want, as I mentioned before, uh, sometimes operating in this uh, shoulder of the plaque is, is beneficial. Okay. Good. Okay. So... We go there and just uh, first in Scopia, we go to four. Okay. Yep. So it already actually looks to be more inflated in that proximal Oops. segment, yeah. not not completely yeah. yet. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. But much better uh, already. It a lot already. Much yeah. better yeah. already. Yeah. Which suggests yeah. that there was you know significant concentricity in that region. And I think you'll have yeah. another region more proximally of concentricity. So when you move the bloom back for the next shock, shock wave sequence. Okay. Yeah, actually, this, um, in this region around the, the side branches where we had all this uh, concentric calcium. Yeah. Perhaps we, so Adam, we could, we could mm -hmm. show the EKG for a second to the colleagues uh, in the lower part. So it would be nice so, so they can see that there, is, there are no ischemic changes. It will also uh, be interesting because you can see sometimes during the delivery of energy, you can see some uh, captures. Uh, so you will be able to see that. It's, uh, in general, there is no problem with that. So go, let's go back to four atmospheres. So it's fair to say that when you see these shock topics, that the, the pressure may go think, down transiently. Uh, I think probably, yeah. But, but there's okay, no, yeah. long, no long term sequelae here. You can see them there now. Yeah. yeah. The there we are. Yeah. And you can see the cavitation oh, yes. bubbles yes. around the emitters in the proximal segment there. Exactly. 
<clears throat> we can move a bit more proximal now, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So perhaps to completely straddle this the lesion. So, so remember, it's, a, it's, it's not a conventional balloon. Uh, the, the, the function of the balloon is not the same like when you're performing a balloon angioplasty. This is very important to remember. And remember the importance also of a uh, look at that. So you have to be careful with that. Okay, let me just see because I, uh, there is so much tension there. Yeah, there's a lot of interaction now, no? That the I think that there is the a lot of interaction perhaps with another wire or something. So I'm bringing it back. I'm just, uh, you see that there is something that is bending. I think that's the other wire perhaps. Mm, yeah. But I want to make sure that it's not um, something funny happening. So here. this so is when the balloon has been deployed once or twice that uh, it, it is uh, if sometimes moving it backwards and forwards yeah, within the lesion. Perfect. So it's now come back. OK. Yeah, that's a good place, I think. Good. Yeah. This. So. OK. Four. OK. So you can see the, pro the wasting in the proximal segment. And. We should see this popping open quite soon. Perhaps m maybe not with this sequence. Yeah, we take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> As mentioned before, I mean, this is a case to take it, easy, to take it very easy. Okay, so no, so you've no used, hurry. I think you've used 30 shocks so far, is that right? 40. So we've 40. got 50 left in this balloon, which I think we need to apply all of that energy to this, this region. So maybe with small, so small movements of the balloon. John and Ravia, do you think it's also an advantage to have this uh, side branch wire in order maybe to, to crack or to, to make a scoring balloon effect? <laughs> a sort of, uh, well, yes, sort of a shockwave, well, poor man's cutting balloon type thing. Um, I don't know. I, I, it, may, it may be. Um, I'm sure someone could do a unless, study Unless, you know, that. perhaps, unless uh, the... The energy is hammering over the wire. I don't think that four atmospheres will contribute uh, no. greatly to. No. <laughs> so I can see that's but already you know, expanding more. Not, it's much better. Yeah. Much better, yeah. but not, I mean, I can, not fully expanded. No. Let me just, uh, let, hmm. let me just uh, show you very quickly. I mean, if um, I have some difficulties here in seeing uh, through my through this, but sure. basically what I'm going to show you in a second is uh, let me show you the, 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 the balloon when we, in the previous, uh, I don't know if you are seeing my, uh, the images that I'm show showing. The sink yeah, let me see. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Okay, let me just stop there. So if we make a quickly, um, yeah. Yeah, seven French. This is definitely expanding in this, this picture. It's not yet fully expanded, but it's it's certainly an improvement from the from right. the start. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid that this view is not. Is, I'm not able to make a QCA to show you the changes, but uh, we will do it later. Okay. But it's, um, okay. I think yeah. it's uh, also obvious no from the. No. So I think deliver all the rest of the shocks. Um, mm. The patient's been stable throughout. No, no hemodynamic yeah. consequences yeah. here. No. No. Do you, you see the um, EKG, you can see that there are some captures there. Yeah. 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 But it's, uh, is it capture or is it just spikes uh, without capture? Yes, I haven't seen, can't see. The well, there are sense. I mean, there are, there are a few reports showing captures, that occasionally, yeah. you know, this uh, may lead to um, interaction with career rhythm, but this is really exceptional. We never had any case. Mm. No. Uh, so, but you know, it's it's good to mention it because then the colleagues know about this. It's something that they <clears> may <throat> see a reflection in the EKG of an electric phenomenon that is taking place in the heart, which is the, the generation of these spikes. Well, it's improving a lot. I think uh, I'm, you know, just bringing it a bit more proximal. Uh, again, it's um, the wire. I don't know if it is a score is, is performing any scoring, but what I can tell you is that it's helping us in. Uh, understanding also the location. I think uh, there, yeah. because we still need, um, need to so open it up a little bit. So we still need to go a bit from more proximal. You can see that uh, from that, so I think Actually, that- you could see, you could see in angiography that it is a region where you have calcium above and below no? the Just balloon. There, so it's um, this region yeah. that really needs uh, yeah, some more pulses. And that, that's a big advantage of, uh, of shock okay. wave to, to have a, a side okay, branch. That. 
AI wire. So this shows the apposition within the left main and the distal constriction in this balloon. So you're right over at one of the emitters now. So perhaps you could film that again and we may see some expansion. It's, it's four atmosphere balloon, but it's, um, it's almost like 50 atmosphere uh, effect, isn't it? I think 50 to, to 80 atmospheres. Uh, but uh, the closer you are to the emitter, the higher the effective pressure that's delivered. Yeah. With no impact at all on the soft tissue. I think it's also worth commenting on the technique of, of, of Yavia here, which is really important for um, maybe some of our younger colleagues. When you've used this balloon a couple of times, or any bulky, any big balloon, it gets really bulky. And so as you're moving it back, notice how Yavier is also adjusting his guide catheter to make sure he's not dissecting the left main. I think that's really because you can really suck in the guide catheter when you try to pull the balloon back. But one of the tricks I use sometimes with the shockwave balloon is I'm struggling to pull it back when I'm in negative, is actually to go to neutral and it actually moves a little bit more in neutral and then I'll go negative again. So just try between neutral and negative and it can sometimes help you move the balloon a little bit easier. Okay, good. So we have uh, just, uh, we can deflate now, Nibis, I think. We have completed the um, uh, energy the life of, of this yeah. uh, device. So we are bringing it back. And you know, at this stage, Nieves, my suggestion will be to perform a new OCT. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we can really understand uh, what has happened. Um, you know, obviously, I think that the, the, there's been a, a huge improvement in the, in the degree of stenosis there. Mm -hmm. So Javier, we what is have the, the maximum pressure you've been to with the balloon? Six. Six atmospheres. Six. Okay. So the delivery of energy, was uh, four. at uh, four atmospheres. Now you're going to set up for another OCT run. I think so, yeah. I think that it will be very, it's, it's very important now to understand in cases like this, you know, the huge calcification, mm -hmm. very important to understand what type of progress you've done. So, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so ready? Remember that here you, you may have some uh, degree of um, 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 recoil. Eh? Yeah, because yeah, absolutely. When we compare this image. <laughs> you can imagine that you have a lot of recoil with this. Uh... There's, there's some good reason to have recoil, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got much better distal clearance, so you, you already know that the, the, lumen, really. the lumen is, is, is significantly enlarged. So let's see how uh, lithotripsy has modified Deletion. Mm, you can see the yeah. deletion fracture clearly. So actually in the distal uh, part, uh, well, first of all, we have clearly improved the lumen because now we have good clearance that we were not able to, to have before. So um, you can see very good clearance. We can maybe later make a measurement here again for the distal reference. Um, and we are entering here the area and you can already see some uh, fractures in so, several So if you just go back points. to that point, mm -hmm. uh, Nieves, just where you showed fractures, this wasn't a constricted area of the vessel. So what, what this shows is that in very large vessels where there is deep wall calcification, that you can modify the calcium even in that region. So this is the total length that the, the total length where the shock wave has been applied is that there is calcium modification at every segment within the vessel. So r nice demonstration that in a very large vessel that there is, there is calcium modification going on. Yeah, you can see here a clear increase in uh, lumen area. Yeah. And there are some fractures that you can see. Fra for so you could just po point, out, hmm? point out the, the fractures there on the axial view. You can see here on uh, around seven, you can see a fracture here. Hmm. Um, nice images. Let's go in detail to see more yeah. fractures. You can see also some there on the... Okay. I, th this I think part the other of the vessel. You can also see some calcification. 
some fractures. About this technology is the lack of dissections. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. here you went, you really modified this calcium in a really safe way. I mean, there's no big dissection. Your risk of perforation is zero. I mean, I think this is really why, you know, shockwave for me is a game changer in these kind of lesions because, you know, in the old days, we'd be going to high pressure with cutting balloons and other mm -hmm. devices where often you end up with dissections later on. And actually, you can see this area is the more resistant one. Eh? It's the one where we we didn't see a complete open, uh, not the balloon completely opening. It's this area where we have this concentric and uh, very, very thick calcium on both sides. So it's the most resistant uh, area. Do you want this one that we are seeing now here in o on OCT. So I think we've seen the... some clear evidence of calcium modification <laughs> with, cr with cracks within the distal part of this concentric area. I'm just wondering whether whether or not, for the purposes of this demonstration, that we should use another balloon uh, in, in this proximal segment. I think so. I Javier, what, 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 do you, what do you think yeah. about this yeah. this proximal segment? Yeah. I think that you know it's, it's worth investing a bit more with energy. So we are going to ask for another shock wave. Uh, vamos a por uno de shock wave de cuatro punto mm. It's worth, it's worth investing a bit more because we, as I told you from the beginning, we, will, we you have to be patient. And the reason because we perform this um, OCT now is to monitor progress. I think we are going in the right direction. Hmm. But you know, I'm sure that now that it will be much easier to move uh, more accurately with the showy balloon inside, hmm. we will be able to prepare it much in depth. And, and, and again, I insist, I'm convinced that this is contributing to the safety of the subsequent mm -hmm. steps. Because at the time that you are expanding uh, this large vessel and displacing so much calcium with your with your stents, you really want to make sure that it has been softened. Mm -hmm. That you know that it's no longer you have big chunks that can you know uh, protrude out of the vessel. So, so that's uh, that's thank you. because it's worth Javier, having. Azim and uh, Benjamin, I think there would be the temptation here to bring in a, a NC balloon for a high pressure dilatation. But I, I think we, if we, we do have access to another balloon and we can use another balloon. So to avoid high pressure traumatic uh, barrow trauma here, I think it should be the aim of this procedure. The sa safety should be, be paramount. And I think my experience with, with going in with a high pressure balloon in this scenario is that if you have unmodified calcium, uh, it, it, I mean, we often see it after stent implantation that you push a boulder of calcium through the wall. So mm -hmm. to avoid that risk of perforation, that, that, that further calcium modification with shockwave, I think is, is indicated here. And, and I like I like the the philosophy of uh, Javier and Nieves because at um, at priori you could say that uh, it's dangerous to go back, but it's written in the sky. It's written on the OCT that uh, the, the the amount of, of calcium, the deepness, the thickness, uh, tells you to uh, to crack the calcium and to fracture it. And the best way to do it is uh, is IVL definitely. So let's let's see what happens. We're, we're intrigued to see this. Um, um, just go, going in the direction of the comment made by Azim, you know, that you could not see dissections of big tears. Mm -hmm. That would be exactly the opposite if your attitude is using a high pressure, sorry, a non-compliant balloon from the beginning. Yes. Then you will see huge, huge, uh, you know, detachments of the rigid plaque from the soft uh, areas of the vessel, etc., you will see huge dis dissection. It navigates very well, as you yeah, can so see. Yeah, so let's concentrate we are very good. now, no? All the shocks in this. I think uh, we are now ready. Uh, we are now proceeding at normal area, speed. No? So, Nieves mm -hmm. is uh, already um, yeah. inflating at four, four atmospheres, you know. You can see the waste there. Yeah. We will monitor this waste, uh, you know. What you can do is try to find the view that is more orthogonal to the waste, so we can really see better uh, the action way of obtaining. I think that this is probably the most orthogonal one. No, viste todos los shocks. You really want to get the, 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 the emitters as close as you can to this the tightest area of concentricity here. Seguro que no. 
And maybe on the on the top of that of the calcified lesion, it's also an osteo lesion. So maybe there is a fibrotic uh, tissue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under this calcium. And see, it's another point with the, the shock wave, and we we do like even it's not a, a three sixty degrees calcification. We do like it this indication in um, in osteo lesion. We do, we have a lack of data uh, mm -hmm. so far, but it's interesting also. Mal can you just show us maybe an acquisition or just a high resolution? Okay. So we can still see that's wasted to a degree. But it's improving a little Much bit. Yeah. But it's better. We, can, we then need to move, to move a bit more proximal, yeah. I think it's much better. Yeah. yeah. So maybe come a little more proximally, because you're definitely yeah. expanded yeah. distally. Yeah. It needs to uh, need to go a bit more proximal. Yeah. Absolutely. So energy. It's improving. Huh? This one, I this last run was it's quite. Much uh, better. Yeah, I think. Uh, I would keep better, keep yeah. going in that region. It it really yeah. it, it is improving. I'm just yeah. putting it back a bit, you know, because I think it's important, uh, as we mentioned before, that. Uh, Cuatro. Yeah. Sometimes you need to to do this. Mm, much, much better. better. Much better. Remember also that, you know, um, we will be more than happy for a circumflex to end up with a lumen, you know, that is six millimeters, seven millimeters uh, square mm -hmm. in terms of area in the minimal extent area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, it's important. I mean, it's so a it left main, not... but it's only a left main for the circle because so the patient a... has a lima. So okay. it's also an important point. I think we can probably keep some more in this area. No? I think we can do one more here in the US too. Again, uh, from the perspective of the patient, uh, the patient is feeling well, not uh, chest pain, no um, EKG changes. So I think this nicely shows the, you know, there is a very heavy calcium burden in this region ar around this bifurcation. Okay. And as Benjamin says, there may well be fibrotic tissue as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what's constraining this is, is the bulk of the calcium, but certainly this lumen is uh, progressively expanding. And it may well be that at, at the nominal pressure of stent implantation that that degree of indentation will re resolve. I, I would not be uh, inclined with this degree of expansion to then go with a high pressure balloon. I think that that's tempting fate and that you, you are potentially then opening yourselves up to the, the complications of high pressure inflation, including perforation. Okay, no, sorry, yes. hmm? okay. Absolutely. I mean, even if you get a small indentation in a, in a stand that is going to be 4 all and that we're going to go, uh, yeah. we're going to push a leg to 5-0, I mean, the area would be huge. So yeah. And again, yes. it's only for the circ, so it's. Uh, Did you see the bubbles there? Clear. Yeah, but, we see uh, them. How many shocks are you up to now? Well, I think that we have now performed. We, we are going to stop. We give uh, 60 more here. Yeah, so we have uh, 20 left, but I think that probably at this point we can stop. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, my. my uh, may I say something, uh, Jonathan? I think that it might be worth now to before uh, anything else, try to go with a short um, four, four millimeter four millimeter balloon, because yeah. you know, sometimes what happens is that you have already uh, a lot of cracks, Busca but you know, six water. atmospheres are not able mm -hmm. to actually open the vessel. And you know, an additional four millimeter uh, balloon may contribute to see if that opens. We will not be, you know, aggressive because I think that we are obtaining what we wanted, we have a good luminal area. Yep. There is clearly a mismatch between the lumen that we see in the OCT and what we see in the in the waste in the balloon. So that means that we have a lot of recoil, yep. and that that recoil can be overcome, you know, by only four atmospheres. So I think that we are safe to mm -hmm. deploy the stems. Yeah. But let me just uh, see how the lesion behaves if we go, you know, sure. with a uh, with a balloon, no compliant, and yeah. non -compliant yeah. balloon, oh. not being aggressive. Just trying to see if we can improve, because in yeah. many occasions you will see that the, the, the plaque has been softened and then opens, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at eight atmospheres or ten atmospheres. So Nieves, can you tell me what the distal external elastic lamina measurement is here? I mean, what's, is it, is, would this vessel take a 4.5 stent? 
let me let or me check it five. now. I'm gonna go in the. Um, I'm gonna go to this last OCT uh, yes. pullback that was much better to see the distal part and I'll make to, a measurement. To keep you updated, uh, we are performing regularly. Uh, we are performing regularly um, ACT measurements. Uh, they are they are good. So everything is um, under control in that regard. And uh, just a question, maybe for Jonathan. Uh, it's the first, it's very teaching case because uh, it's the first time I see uh, two uh, shockwave balloon used on the same lesion. Is it, um, did you ever see that, John? Um, yes, when there's very bulky calcium and we see this with more with much longer lesions, but I think there is there was a justification here that the proximal part of the vessel, uh, the proximal part of this lesion, uh, was not fully modified. So uh, I think it's it will be an unusual occurrence. Uh, I wouldn't say that this would be a, this is not a frequent occurrence. But if you if you were to look at your algorithm and going back to the algorithm you presented uh, in in this masterclass, they if you work your way through the algorithm and intravascular imaging following your first stage of calcium modification, then this would have fed back and and the, it would have come out with the answer would have been use IVL again. So it's not going to be a it's not going to be a, a common occurrence. Because most of the time, Wait. there is uh, it, it's effective in the very first um, in the very first uh, application of energy. What I think we're seeing here <laughs> is a degree of uh, fibrous tissue as well as calcium. Okay. That it, there is a degree of recoil. So there's been better balloon expansion that we see on the OCT. So this is an uncompliant. Okay. Adiós. 14, 14, 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 14 what, what would, would you be satisfied with this expansion yeah. here? I think the expansion is really good. I like Javier's technique of following it with a non-compliant balloon. Um, you know, while I appreciate Jonathan, you know, and I love Shockwave for the fact that it avoids us from using high pressure, I think we have to be realistic that sometimes we treat some very difficult and complex lesions where <clears throat> the Shockwave will do the hard work of making of maybe putting those cracks in the calcium but i often find that i have to then follow it on with something else sure um and follow it on with maybe a non-compliant balloon sometimes to high pressure as well um and i've often had to do even a little bit of scoring balloon after after shockwave because it's a a really badly calcified lesion mm -hmm. I don't see that as a negative part or it doesn't detract away from what the shockwave did because when I do that, I, I find the results I get are, are safe uh, because I'm not having to do the initial cracks of the mm -hmm. calcium with a, a cutting balloon. But I think you know what Javier is showing is before you want to put your stent in, you really have to be sure that you're not going to get any surprises sure. and risk getting stent under expansion. I should perhaps qualify my comments. When I'm saying high pressure, I'm meaning the ultra high pressure balloons. So, okay. uh, so really looking at the, the, the so the OPN technology which is available in Europe. So this is not something that I would go in with an with an OPN balloon. Mm -hmm. Uh, so certainly normal pressure NC balloon dilatation, I think, is absolutely, yeah, absolutely indicated. It's, it's, yeah. the, it's avoiding the very high pressure um, NC balloons, uh, so going into the sort of 30, 40 atmosphere range. Yeah, absolutely. And, and before I go, I'm just going to say, you know, what a great case again uh, from Javier, because you really took us through how you you treat a very complex calcified lesion using imaging guidance and using you know the best technologies we have right now to do it in a very safe and efficacious way so thank you for letting me be part of this javier and Beautiful. for joining your lab and watching this great case thank you azim thank you for thank you for your comments azim
Thank you, Asim. Have a good day. In the Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so, bye. What no pressure have you got the balloon at here, mm -hmm. Nieves? How how high is the the balloon? What's your deployment pressure and, here? Um, 16 atmospheres. 16 this atmospheres. Is the and, yeah. And you can see that it was. Um, yeah. Yeah. So We're going to show you now some stem boost uh, to see. Can, um, can we see? Can we show sync uh, Alex in the lower? Sync vision to um, show them the expansion. Do some interference yeah. with the with the so wires, yeah, but, but it looks uh, okay look right. to me. I think. Let me just yeah. have a look to. Well, well, let's have a look to what happened with that small side branch in a second. We could certainly see opened, uh, really well. good expansion there. There was some indentation, but certainly uh, a vast improvement from, from the point we, we started. Very mild, this Quarter indentation, round, I think. Let's, uh, let's get now, the, let's do a pot now with um, five-fold. Danos un balón no compliante de cinco, por favor. Que sea corto. So five oh in the left main only. Yeah. No, no post yeah. that. Más corto no hay. So no we post. go directly. We go directly with a four point five or five millimeter uh, balloon. You know, proximal. There is no need to. We know that we have to do that. So yeah. You saw if uh, you can see an OCT. You know, no the need vessel to check is anything. huge at this level. It's actually maybe more than five, but yeah. Um, yeah. Five, I think, is uh, is enough. <coughs> it's, uh, as you can see in the left main, there is uh, we are landing in a very healthy area so it's a good expansion of the stent yeah excellent yeah. Uh, and I, I must say that uh, in 90 percent of the cases 80 percent of the cases we do not uh, post dilate after performing you know lithotripsy but that's because we we've seen that we have achieved a complete expansion and as i say is uh, the intention here and, and actually it worked was to it was, it was really just um, certainly with this type test, of no? this type of lesion with such a large vessel uh, your msa here well, i'm sure will be highly satisfactory you'll be well above yeah. the, the the range of of where you would be you'd be expecting any any future long term events exactly and it's the yeah. kind of vision we were uh, disappointed with the results uh, a few uh, years or months ago without this technology. Even after... Well, it's the, yeah, it's the most challenging location, no? In the coronary tree, the osteal shark. Exactly. So, still can give us some surprises in the future, but let's see. <laughs> I mean, probably the acute result is going to be uh, very good. Okay, so yeah. as always, you know, this is a tricky uh, moment to enter the vessel because you don't want to damage the extent that is uh, probably, you know, uh, so I look, uh, you know, from so different... what uh, balloon have you got here? My... What, Javier, what balloon are you taking here? Is this a five, five millimeter? Five oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah it's this five oh. Five oh NC. Is it NC yeah. or yeah. a can compliant you... balloon? Can we see, can we see in the lower the screen, please, the We don't have the uh, compliant no, okay. it's a, it's a <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> so I, usually... That is the location we, I we have now. Them, you can see... Um, so you say that we only have NCs. I think it's good, Nieves. I think that yeah, we can I think so. There. so. Yeah, we, you can see the samples. I think it's fine. Let's go there. Let's post I laid here. Yeah, it's and a really, We are just opposing it to the vessel because actually at this level there is not... Um, yeah, you don't need to chase the external elastic exactly. lamina, no. Yeah. So you can yeah. see dis distal constraint of that balloon there, so yeah. it will be opposed at its proximal edge. Yeah, but they remember that well, the intention we have with this balloon now is uh, simply to make sure that we have, yeah. uh, you know, proper Apposition, yeah. expansion of the proximal part. I mean, we can... We can uh, deploy... Now, we can use now the four millimeter uh, balloon that we had on the table just to make sure that the stent is properly opposed mm -hmm. in, the, um, yeah. in the region of you know and for the for the, for yeah. colleague hmm? I, I like the the way uh, javier uh, put the, the the pod balloon in the left main mm -hmm. very slowly without forcing on the gun wire and uh, try to be a uh, very coaxial to to avoid yeah. the longitudinal yeah. crushing obviously. yeah it's um yeah. Yes, as a you say, Benjamin, it's a, it's a very important aspect also mm. to remember to the colleagues that is one specific location where the possibility of interaction 
-hmm. between the guiding catheter and the stent is, is very high. Yeah. And you can you can ruin your case, you know, uh, yeah. at the very end. El so it's always very important to do that. Cuatro. Typically, what I do in that situation is first, I try to reorient my guiding catheter to see that advances nicely. If it That's doesn't, what I do sometimes is I inflate my balloon, you know, a 4.5 millimeter balloon, to one atmosphere. Then I deflated it. And by doing that, you get that the balloon is uh, becomes uh, with less shoulders, so to speak, or is, is more rounded. And then sometimes you advance it more easily. Yeah. But, yeah. but the, the message is never try to never force it force and never it. advance it. Because then you, you, you may be in problem. Especially the when you have a jade wire. Yes. No, stents are, the contemporary stents are not designed for supporting, you know, a longitudinal, for receiving longitudinal forces. They are, they're very good in radial strength, but uh, you can damage the whole thing. Good. So once so, that we do this, we'll make an OCT and, and see what yeah, happens. Yeah, this is the 4.0. Uh... So again, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's na it navigates very well now. Uh, I think Nieves, this will be roughly the place. Let me just get it uh, with the SyncRx so we can see it. Yeah, yeah maybe. That is, uh, that is what we want to... Yeah, manage. it's the, the area that was this is. Yeah. Uh, so now, we, more now, you know, we can go, no, no problem. We are not yeah. dissecting the vessel or anything. We are just expanding the balloon. We can go to 16, 18 or 20. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Looks to be fully... Nearly fully expanded there. Abajo. Abajo. Yep. Nice demonstration, yeah. yeah. Always wait. We look always to this, uh, to the deflator to see if the bubbles have stopped uh, moving in the coming back to the deflator. It's a good indicator that you know that you have deflated your balloon. Look to my guy getting catheter. Okay. Keep keep my guy catheter away. Okay, that's another another place. Yeah. Well, yeah. Eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Looks good. Looks yeah, good. Looks really good. Yeah. Congratulations. Hello. So now an OCT to finish. OCT. Yeah. Yes. That's correct. And uh, you know, many many colleagues will probably and and we discussed that before. Will think, oh, it's a left main. Don't use OCT. But you know, in this particular case, uh, we have the distinct advantages of uh, better visualization of uh, the calcium depth. Mm -hmm. um, we we noticed that there was something like you know this um, ten millimeters, well, more fifteen millimeters of vessel, you know, uh, up to the stenosis, and, and and I think that is a good demonstration that actually you can. Yes. Use OCT in cases like this in the left main for good uh, guidance yeah. of your PCI. And the co-registration yeah, is, is, is phenomenal. Yeah. I, this, I mean, the, the quality of the pictures here, you've got every measurement uh, that you need, every measurement that you want that you would get from, from IVUS, uh, but you also have additional information. So I think it's, okay. uh, this is a great, a great demonstration of the utility of OCT in, in a large left main. Yeah, and for, and for the contrast, the, um, the most important thing is to keep it in mind. I mean, just not do angiograms that are not needed. Just save your contrast uh, for your OCT and you will get all the information. How has the patient been throughout this procedure? Has there been any issues at all? Any hemodynamic instability? No, no, no he's no, completely no. asymptomatic. He didn't uh, notice uh, anything during the procedure. bien. <laughs> It's feeling fine. He's just tired of being on the table, of course. Just to be tired, but otherwise, uh, he's saying but that with a dramatic. smile, so that's that's very good. So Benjamin, perhaps whilst we're waiting for these new OCT oh. pictures to appear, in in your left main practice, are you using predominantly IVUS, or are you is it a mixture of IVUS and OCT? I'm still conventional IVUS guy for a left main. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more an habit and uh, maybe a stereotype that um, OCT is more more difficult. No, yeah. the mm -hmm. Are you convinced by the pictures that you've seen today mm -hmm. about yeah. the utility of OCT in these very large left mains? Yes, I am. Maybe uh, in that case, mm -hmm. I'm very classified. Uh, 
lesion OCT is maybe a bit superior to uh, to show thickness of the calcium. It's maybe easier than IFUS. Uh, but I like IFUS also mm -hmm. it, it, it giving you uh, kind of the same information. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we just you know have a mild attempt uh, using uh, um, yep. guiding catheter extension just to support a bit the OCT to advance because it was what difficult. Is, uh, so the... it advances very nicely, you know. Uh, is this to help with the pacification, or is it just the positioning since no, the stent has gone no, in? No, simply because the the OCT is not uh, negotiate is not. Yes. Um, it's prolapsing, yeah. It's often, the the, often an issue going but, into the angulation of a circumflex, especially yeah. where there's rigidity from calcium, and there may be one or two little flex, uh, spicules of calcium yeah. pro projecting out into the lumen. So they may, it may impinge on the OCT catheter. But exactly. Think, uh, so that's a, you know, but that's a, I can tell you that the navigation of this uh, guide extension Guiding catheter extension has been uh, phenomenal. So that means that, you know, we have a beautiful lumen over there. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you can now deliver the, yes. deliver the OCT through. Yeah. Now, now, of course, what I will do is I will uh, retire it because I don't want to make a selective injection. Mm -hmm. And I will put it away, something like 40 centimeters, so it is not, uh, you know, displaced by the power injector. Good, so I think, uh, Nieves, what, do you like the place? I think so, yeah. Yeah, Let's so see. can we have the OCT yeah, on the lower the part, there, yeah. uh, Adam? And Javier, was it easy to uh, pull back your jail wire? Yes, it was, yeah. I just kept the control. You can see that. Actually, this wire, this uh, small branch was receiving also some collateral support. Mm. Yeah. But in any case, you, you see that it's, uh, it is patent. Mm. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. So, Nieves, if you could yeah, just ro rotate, <laughs> rotate it round, please. Just ro rotate the image so the longitudinal yeah. view, yeah. I think it, you, because it's a slightly eccentric cut, just rotate that. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's exaggerating the... Yeah. yeah. The stenosis, there we go. Yeah? The, but there we it, go. it's very eccentric, really eccentric. Mm. Yeah? So, yeah, but, but you know, it's, let, let's have a look to the luminal area. Uh, and we'll see. And the, okay, and this, this leave, it, leave it in that this. orientation. And then perhaps if you can then fly down through the vessel. But let's, yeah. that region, so this, what, what do, how do you interpret these images here, yeah, yeah, Nieves? Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your view of, your lumen size here is large, 7.48 millimeters squared. Mm. Yes. yes, it's very elliptical, so that's why in some, mm -hmm. uh, no, in some views it might look uh, as you have no, a larger stenosis than you really have. It's a, it's a large area, it's um, uh, eight millimeters. Um, this is the region actually where we had this very resistant uh, calcium, very thick, concentric, and the area where we applied, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, 80 plus 60 sh uh, shocks. Oh. So, and we have post dilated this already high pressure with a non compliant balloon. I think this area is enough for this, uh, for this circ. I wouldn't go um, uh, any farther uh, in, this, uh, in this region. Of course, there is under expansion if you compare it with the distal and proximal edge. You can see that the expansion at the other levels of the stand is really good. Mm -hmm. This is the distal part. And as we go into this area, that was also a part of the lesion that was very calcified, but not so concentric and not so thick, you can see here that the stent at this level has opened very well. But this, um, this was the very resistant area with this uh, uh, completely uh, uh, 360, mm -hmm. very thick uh, layer of calcium. Um, and I think, uh, I think the, the result, the area there is enough. I mean, even when there is some under expansion. Mm -hmm. This is the left main that you can see, uh, we have opposed it very well. So. At the level of the of the lamp main, yeah. the, the stain looks uh, very good. So this is um, the you know the, the stain that we use is a biomatrix alpha, um, mm -hmm. and you can see that it has expanded very nicely. It's a four point zero stain. Uh, yeah. it, it could be nicely yeah, expanded but it has you know, to reach well an area main, of yeah. uh, nineteen millimeter squares. Huge. Yeah. Um, and again, you know the, the, the as always, I mean the, the, the decisions that you make. 
are based on objective evidence and it is everything much more predictable. Yeah. Uh, and we, remember that we mentioned we are opening a lumen for a big circumflex, not for the left coronary artery, mm -hmm. not for the whole left coronary artery. And you know, an area of eight millimeters squares is um, is minimal stent area of eight eight point seventy six yeah. millimeters squares yeah. is very good. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, I think that um, we are very happy and we will leave it here. Actually, that's a. Uh, so a very, a very safe procedure, so low pressure inflations, lots of shockwave energy delivered, very significant calcium modification. But I think it, it shows that the distribution of calcium uh, within this lesion, there, were, there was very deep wall calcium here. Now you've certainly modified it to, to allow you to expand the lumen from probably around 1.5 millimeters squared to 7.5. So, Benjamin, would you, would you be tempted at this point to take in a high pressure balloon and to do a very high pressure inflation here? Or do you think that this, this is a satisfactory result with a good lumen size and that, that's the end point that we should be satisfied with? Yeah, what I think it, uh, I, I'm always tempted when I see imaging and images, but uh, as uh, Ravier and Nieves just told us, uh, you have a very large uh, minimal stent area, and uh, I think uh, if you are doing FFR in that in that uh, in that circumflex, uh, it's going to be more than uh, uh, 0.90 for sure. So I will leave it like okay. this. Yeah, it's an excellent result. It's a very uh, teaching case, and thank you so much to illustrate so well uh, this algorithm and all the steps uh, needed for. Uh, calcium modification, calcium assessment score. It was very, uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. So Javier, well, perhaps I could, for the last word from you, just to, you've done a lot of these cases and I mean, this is really a, a fantastic uh, result from really a very, very challenging lesion. So what would be your message uh, about uh, to, to the perhaps younger operators who are introducing shockwave into their practice, and in particular, the, the safe well, approach for dealing with left main stem lesions. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, the, me the message is that um, I'm afraid that we're going to see more and more cases with complex uh, anatomy, lots of classification, you know, you can, you, we could debate, you know, if even that might be, you know, a consequence of the ischemia well, trial, you. where, you know, perhaps uh, less risk profiles will be opted for medical treatment. But certainly we are going to see a lot of these cases because of the aging of the population, post cabbage, many of these situations. And I think that, you know, what um, we try to share with you is that it is not only um, using a specific device, is understanding what is uh, uh, what actions should be performed and, and what the steps should be fulfilled before implanting a stents to ensure that you have a very good result. Um, I think that we have emphasized the word uh, nearest patients a lot of times. We told you beforehand, we are not going to rush with the delivery of energy in this, uh, in this particular case. And actually, you know, as, as we also anticipated, we had to use two balloons. But I hope that you know that the colleagues also see that uh, lithotripsy is a very simple uh, technique to use, to get used to it, um, that um, you can really obtain uh, results that speak by, you know, by themselves, like in this uh, case. And we really hope that you know that, that the educational messages that were shared today, and thank you again for, for joining us in, 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 in a day of work, full screen. will okay. be useful for, for the attendees in, in their practice and to help patients like, uh, like ours. Well, thank you, Javier, and a big thank you to you and uh, Nieves, a beautiful uh, demonstration of uh, intravascular imaging, a wonderful demonstration of the utility of shockwave, and thank you to all the team at uh, Clinic San Carlos in Madrid. So also a thank you to uh, Benjamin Fori and uh, Azim Latib uh, for, for their expert commentary. And now back to the studio. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Our next speaker is Benjamin Fori from the Cardiovascular Institute in Grenoble in France. And today he's going to be speaking to us about the 
fundamental techniques for intravascular lithotripsy. Welcome to you, Benjamin. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for your kind invitation to this uh, masterclass about um, calcium and shockwave technology. So let's talk about now intravascular lithotripsy techniques. And to get into this topic, we have to have in mind all the algorithm about calcium assessment. So first on the left hand side, if you can cross, if you can cross with your balloon, you will need probably to advance a microcatheter in order to deliver a atherectomy guy wire in order to treat this. Otherwise, if you cannot cross with your macrocatheter, you should go directly with your rotor wire or your, or your viper wire, or if you have access to laser, you could go directly to laser. If you can cross, then you can dilate, but you will need probably to complete with a lithotripsy if the calcium is deep or thick, etc., as you can appreciate here. On the downside of the screen, if you can cross your, your balloon, pre-dilate, you should imaging your lesion and then definite your calcium angle, the thickness, and then if it's more than 180 degrees, more than uh, 0.5 millimeters, you should go directly to a shockwave device. If the lesion in le is long, long, longer than five millimeters, you should go maybe to atherectomy, orbital or rot ablation in order to treat and open this lesion. If it's long, but if the calcium is deep, you should also try uh, atherectomy, but you also could do lithotripsy because of the depth of the calcium. At the end, of course, check by imaging your uh, result before stenting. So in case of a very calcified uh, subtotal occluded vessel, you might need uh, using a rot ablation in order to prepare the lesion and to cross uh, with the IVL balloon, with the shockwave balloon. In that case of the LAD uh, lesion, rot ablation with a 1.5 bur, inflation of the shockwave balloon, pre-dilatation, imaging to see the calcium fracture after NC balloon, and you can appreciate here the calcium fracture on the yellow crosses. And this is after stenting and the final result. This is called rota uh, shock, and this is a combination of, of devices um, that might be needed. Another uh, under-recognized technique is to partially inflate the shockwave balloon, like in that uh, drawing. You advance the nose of the balloon without crossing it fully because it's not possible. Inflate, deliver the therapy, and then deflate and advance again the balloon. In that case, the balloon advance, and then you deliver the therapy once again and to crack the lesion at the correct place. This is the stent expansion and uh, the delivery of the energy. So in that case of uncrossable lesion with the uh, shockwave catheter, you can use the anchoring balloon that you, can, uh, that you know, or you can use a guide extension with a regular uh, low profile balloon, inflate into the lesion, advance the guide extension, and then cross the lesion with the guide extension and deliver the shockwave balloon with that technique. So it's another technique to face a uh, subtotal occluded lesion and you can deliver safely the, uh, your device. So in conclusion, a tailored calcium approach is mandatory for all calcified lesion for a good stent expansion and better outcomes. And the key point is imaging and the calcium score, which is going to be assessed depending on a few important things like angle, length, thickness, and depth of this calcium. And then we're going to assess again the calcium fracture 
which are a key for ideal stent expansion and good outcomes. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Benjamin, for an excellent presentation. Going back to your comments about pragmatic pre-dilatation, can you just give us a, an idea of what proportion of cases where you think that there may be a significant calcium burden and that calcium modification is required, what proportion of those cases does pragmatic pre-dilatation deliver the expansion that you need? All right, it's an excellent question, but um, this depends a lot of, uh, do you have access a lot to IVUS or RCT or imaging to characterize your plaque? If yes, I would say it's most of the time, but if no, if you don't have uh, full access to this uh, endovascular image, I would, I would use this pragmatic predilatation to palpate the lesion and to see if you have a correct expansion of your balloon. And if not, use your algorithm with a shockwave, rotor, uh, orbital, extra. Mm -hmm. And so in the cases where you are using calcium modification, do you think that you're looking now at your intravascular imaging pictures in a different way now that we have shockwave. Yeah, exactly. That's also a good point. And I see that uh, we have some discrepancy between angio and HIVUS uh, images. And uh, last week we did a, a left main stenting a bit like this with an under expansion of a balloon. And in HIVUS we can see a deep and thick calcium that oblige us to use a uh, IVL. And it's funny to see that uh, we are, we just say that uh, we didn't know how to do this a few years ago without this uh, game changing technology, especially in large vessel like uh, left main or a big uh, LAD. Now you've been a complex PCI operator for uh, well over a, a decade doing a, a very, very complex cases, including CTOs and a, a, and a lot of left main stem interventions. And I would suspect you've been predominantly an intra-IVUS operator, pr predominantly up until this point. Where do you see OCT uh, being introduced into the, the calcium algorithm? Do you think it adds anything further over and above IVUS, or do you think IVUS is sufficient? I would, would say IVUS is a very good tool. Uh, we know very well the, the semantic of the IVUS, but uh, maybe OCT is a bit better to assess the thickness of the calcium. It's maybe easier to uh, measure, measure the thickness of the calcium because uh, in case of IVUS and thick calcium, you can have some uh, reverberation and no echo be, beyond that. So maybe OCT is a good uh, new technology. And what about your experience, particularly in left main lesions? Would you use OCT in that scenario? I'm more an IVUS guy in, uh, in, uh, in left main, uh, as I told. Uh, maybe it's, it's a stereotype and I have to fight against that because uh, OCT can, can, can assess very good images even in large vessel, in, even in, in osteolesion, lesion, if, uh, if it's uh, well executed. But uh, IVUS is, a, is a very, uh, the key for, uh, for left main stenting for mm -hmm. me to go back and forth and to, to, to redo it, uh, especially in a high bleeding rich patient with a low um, clearance, for example. Now, we've, we've clearly seen the effectiveness of IVL in, in multiple different forms of calcium modification, whether it's concentric or eccentric lesions, that it seems to be effective in, in all forms of, uh, of calcium uh, uh, distribution. Rather than thinking about the effectiveness, perhaps you could comment to me about the safety of the procedure. How do you see IVL increasing the safety of some of these uh, complex procedures? I think it's mainly due to data that uh, we get from the first uh, uh, studies. Of course, uh, for example, rupture uh, perforation is uh, very low in uh, even in complex PCI. It's less than one percent. So, we we know that IVL is a safe technology. 
maybe because it's a low pressure balloon, but you know that uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, generate more than 50, 60, 70 uh, uh, atmosphere with this balloon. But just data is telling us that uh, it's safe, but we have to, 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 to collect all the data uh, up to now uh, to uh, verify this, uh, this, uh, this uh, proof. I think the Disrupt uh, program, CAD 1, CAD 2, CAD 3, CAD 4, has really consistently shown that as well as being highly effective in lesion modification and stent expansion, that the, there's been an overwhelming message that this is a very, very safe technology. So could I ask you, where, where do you see IVL fitting in to complex PCI practice, but perhaps more generally thinking about PCI more broadly. So is this a technique that should be available in every cath lab to ev and be used by every PCI operator? So I would say yes in the Heidel world, because IVL is a, uh, is a most known technology in case of undilatable uh, lesion. Uh, or after uh, retablation, when you have uh, under stent ex uh, under balloon expansion and uh, things like this, or if you uh, ivus uh, the lesion and the thick the thickness of the calcium tells you that uh, nothing could work except uh, IVL. So yes. So thank you very much, Ben, for your outstanding contribution. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Join us next week on Friday the 14th of May for Class 3, Imaging of Coronary Arterial Calcium. We will be exploring the diagnosis of coronary arterial calcium, which imaging modality offers the highest resolution and the most relevant information to patient management. And you can find out how to diagnose calcium fractures and understand their relevance to optimal stent expansion. And we will be hearing from Anya Oxnes, who will be talking about detection of coronary arterial calcium, all about the angiogram. Margaret McIntaggart will be talking on the subject of IVUS and the detection of calcium. And finally, Kevin Croach on the role of OCT in the evaluation of calcium, insights from CAD3. We look forward to you joining us for the next masterclass.